Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, as always. And today I have the great honor of being here with Dr. Jeff McMahon. He is the White's Professor of Moral Philosophy at the University of Oxford. He specializes in practical, practical ethics, political philosophy and ethics. He is the author of books like The Morality of Nationalism, The Ethics of Killing, Problems at the Margins of Life, and Killing in War, among others. So, Jeff, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. And as I said, it's a real honor to everyone. Thanks, Ricardo. I'm, I'm really happy to be able to do this. Thank you very much. Okay, great. So, I mean, the first thing I would like to say is that uh, when I read The, the Ethics of Killing, uh, I mean, I really loved the book. It's a, a massive one, but it completely changed my mental framework in terms of thinking about uh, killing, the ethics of killing, even uh, uh, questions related to abortion and euthanasia and things like that. So, I mean, thank you for writing the book. Uh, it's one of my favorite philosophy books. So just to put this out there. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm really surprised that, that you read it. As you say, it's a very long book and it's rather densely argued. And I think very few philosophers ever read it, and I'm, I didn't, I'm not aware of anybody who's ever read it all the way through. So, uh, so I'm very pleased that you read it, and I'm grateful for those nice comments. Thank you. Well, I, I'm sort of a crazy guy, you know. So, well, you have to be. I, I, I pick up a 600-page book and I read it till the end. So, well, and anyway, anyway, let, let's start with the question. So. I guess that uh, one interesting thing to start here off with would be to ask uh, what death is about, because I guess that particularly when the medical communi community uh, created the concept of brain death or being brain dead, then, I, I mean, things got more complicated with that. And now defining when someone is really dead or not, and even more so from a philosophical perspective, might be a bit complicated, right? Yeah. Uh, what I think is that there is no single way of understanding what death is. Um, one way to illustrate this is to point to the passage in the Bible in which Jesus says, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, something like that. I may not be getting the quotation right. But he doesn't mean that people who live and believe in him will never undergo brain death or will never, will never stop their biological functioning. He means they will never cease to exist because they will continue to live even after their bodies die. Now, what people in medicine are particularly interested in is when a, a, a human organism dies and most of them assume that we cease to exist at the same time our body dies but those are se could be separate events and I actually think that they are separate I think that I could cease to exist uh, before my body died um, you know there are cases in which um, we can keep uh, a brain dead body functioning mm -hmm. um, so that for example a, a pregnant woman who's been diagnosed as being brain dead can ca her body can be kept functional for long enough for the baby to be delivered and that, that can be for months and when when that happens I think what people think is their death refers to the sort of ceasing to exist of the person and that's compatible with something like continued activity in the body and I think what a lot of doctors feel forced to say about that kind of case is well no actually that body isn't actually alive it's just um, being kept functioning in certain ways I think that's rather silly it seems to me that's clearly a living body um, uh, so we have these controversies uh, and we need to get clear about when we are referring to death, whether we're referring to a biological event that can be detected by physicians, for example, or whether we're talking about a metaphysical event, which is the ceasing to exist of somebody like you or me. Mm -hmm. Yes, th that's why I thought it was a good question to start the, the interview with. 
But mm -hmm. then, I mean, we're talking about killing. And uh, in the domain of ethics, what constitutes an act of killing? Does it have to be, uh, for example, intentional in some way or not? I, I guess not fr uh, from what I got from your book, but could you clarify that? Sure. Um, again, killing is bringing about uh, the death of something. I mean, we can kill plants, we can kill animals, we can kill people. Uh, it's bringing about the death of something. And ambiguities about what death consists in can transfer to our understanding about when what count, constitutes an act of killing. Yeah. Um, so, for example, I'll just just tell you this very quickly. Uh, on my view, an early abortion, say an abortion one month after conception, um, is an act of killing in the sense that it what it does is it kills a living human embryo. But it doesn't kill somebody like you or me because, in my view, we don't exist yet. I don't think I came into existence until some months after my body was conceived. So, again, would killing, would having an early abortion be a killing in the morally significant sense? Well, no, not on my view, but it would be a, the, the, the bringing about the biological death of a biological entity. Um, but... Um, Killing does not have to be in, intentional. We can kill people by accident. We can kill people foreseeably but unintentionally. So this happens in war when, uh, uh, when a, a, a pilot drops a bomb on a military facility, um, intending only to destroy the military facility, knowing that some innocent people are going to be killed as a side effect, but that's only as a side effect. It's not what the pilot intends to do. So killing can be unintended and not even accidental in some cases. It can be foreseen but not intended. Um, killing does contrast with letting someone die and there's a lot of controversy about how to draw that distinction. Um, but um, generally speaking, um, an act of killing is, it has to be an act, it has to be the doing of something normally uh, that uh, brings about the death of a person. But there are also certain causal requirements, certain requirements of causal proximity. We have a notion in law of approximate cause. So I may do something that is necessary to bring about somebody's death, but there are many other intervening causes. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, in that kind of case, when there are many other causal conditions of the death, I, my act wouldn't be picked out as one of killing, even though it was a necessary, uh, an act that was necessary for the death. So it has to be causally rather close to the death to count as an act of killing. I should say that um, while the notion of killing is very important in ethics insofar as it contrasts with let, letting someone die, um, and uh, because acts of killing are generally highly morally objectionable, um, it's an important notion in ethics. Um, but because it has these um, blurred boundaries to it, like you know exactly how closely causally connected the act has to be with the death, um, it's not ethically a really fundamental notion. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and there are also different types of killing, I guess. So, um, is there any conceptual or theoretical framework in terms of, for, for example, uh, principles of ethics that we can apply to all instances of killing? Or do you think that we have to approach them on a case-by-case -case basis? I think we have to think of them uh, not so much case by case but type by type okay. because and, and what this means is basically that there are there are different reasons in different cases why killing is wrong or at least there are reasons that may apply strongly in one case but not less strongly or not at all in another so it's not that killing is wrong for one single reason. I think there are, there are various reasons why killing is generally wrong. And then there are also 
as, as I think everyone recognizes, there's some instances in which killing is morally justifiable. Most people think, for example, in self-defense it's permissible to kill. Most people believe it's permissible to kill in war, so on and so forth. So most people believe that there are instances in which killing another person uh, can be morally justified. But if you look into it rather deeply, you'll find that there are different forms of justification. Um, sometimes the just in punishment, for example, there are people. I think this is barbaric, but some people think that uh, uh, killing is justified as a form of punishment. Those people think that the justification for killing typically is that the person deserves to die. So it's a desert-based justification. Um, in other cases, we think somebody it, it's permissible to kill somebody because they've made themselves morally liable to be killed by virtue, for example, of uh, posing a, a wrongful threat to the life of another person. So in self-defense, we would have a what I would call a liability justification for killing. Um, there are other cases, I mentioned a moment ago, the case of uh, the side effect killing of civilians in war, that would be what's called a lesser evil justification. We'd say that the, 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 those innocent people who are killed by a, 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 a military bombing don't deserve to die, they're not morally liable to be killed, uh, they have a right not to be killed, but what we say is that in some cases their right is overridden because of the extreme importance of the destruction of the military target and the saving of other innocent lives. So there you'd say, well, the killing these people is bad, it's objectionable, but it's the lesser evil. And there are other forms of justification as well. For example, in abortion, obviously fetuses don't deserve to die, they can't be liable to be killed. Maybe the justification for abortion is some kind of lesser evil justification, but what people would, what I think a lot of people would want to say about abortion, though not all by, by any means, is that the normal objections to killing may not apply in the case of abortion um, because of the, the, the lower moral status of the, of the fetus. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so let's speak on that last part, uh, having to do with abortion and the more uh, the lower moral status of the fetus. Because isn't it the case that uh, one of the factors or a set of factors that we have to take into account when thinking about the ethics of killing and the killing of a particular being? He has to do with the psychological capacities that that particular being is endowed with. Yeah. Well, that's certainly my view. My view is that uh, different living entities can have different types of moral status. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, I myself am vegan. I've been vegetarian or vegan since I was 17 years old. I think there are strong moral reasons not to kill animals if we can avoid it. But I don't think those reasons are exactly the same as the reasons that we have not to kill other persons. So I think persons have a higher moral status than animals have. And I also think that the moral status of a person can vary within that individual's own life. So I think I did begin to exist as a fetus, but I think many months after conception, but I began to exist in my view when there was some when there was something present that was conscious or had the capacity for consciousness. Uh, that was me. But I think it, when I first began to exist as a barely conscious fetus, my moral status was lower. Um, than it is now. I didn't have the same rights then that I have now, and that's because I now have developed psychological capacities that I lacked when I first came into existence as a fetus. Other people think that you know what's what makes uh, human beings like you and me uh, different morally from animals is that we have a soul or that we are made in the image of God or something like that. Um, I've argued against those views in, in some of my work. I don't accept them. I think we have to accept that what makes us fundamentally different morally from animals is a matter of our psychological capacity and possibly in some ways our psychological potential as well.
Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, are you referring to things like, for example, uh, our higher rational capacity, um, the fact that, for example, we are able to experience or to have a wider array of experiences of pleasure and pain that probably, or at least we, we don't have enough evidence to suppose that any other animal also has. I mean, are you talking about those sorts of things? Partly. What I have in mind more, though, is something like, well, first and fundamentally, the capacity for self-consciousness. Okay. To understand uh, that, that, that I exist, that my memories are of my past, that I have a future that I can anticipate and plan for. Um, so rationality and autonomy are also important because I am capable of thinking about the fact that I have a future life. I can think about how I ought to live that life, how best to live, and then I can uh, plan and, uh, and, and try to uh, guide my life by my values and my ideals and achieve the kind of life that, that I want. I can act on the basis of reasons. I'm sensitive to moral reasons. And I do think that in general, um, it is important to our moral status that we are um, beings capable of moral sentiment and moral judgment and uh, morally responsible action. So all of these things matter. Um, we also, as persons, I think, do have accessible to us dimensions of well-being that are not really accessible to lower animals. They certain, but they also weren't accessible to us very early in our lives, uh, when our cognitive and psychological capacities were sometimes even lower than those of, of some non-human animals. Um, so I, I, I think that's important. That is that our I think our lives have the potential for being uh, much richer in uh, well-being in multifarious ways than the lives of animals can be. On the other hand, I do think animals have uh, the capacity, many animals at any rate, have the capacity for very great suffering, particularly great physical suffering, but also emotional anguish as well. And I think we have to be very attentive to that fact about other animals. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are two theories that you mention in your book, the theory of personal identity and the one of egoistic concern. Uh, uh, could you tell us about them and how important they are for us to better understand or to apply to the case of killing and, uh, I mean, to, uh, to some specific situations like, for example, abortion and things like that? Uh, I mean, to give us a framework to work with and to solve those kinds of difficult questions. The, the notion of personal identity is just the notion of what it is for a person to exist, for a person to begin to exist, continue to exist, and cease to exist. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we ask about what are the conditions of personal identity, we're asking about what is it for a person to exist and continue to exist? And so when we ask, when does somebody cease to exist, we're asking a question about personal identity. But We're asking what's necessary for a person to continue to exist. And when those things cease, then the person has ceased to exist. Yeah. Uh, the notion of egoistic concern is quite different. It's the... Um, the form of concern that each of us has for him or herself in the future. So when I'm told I'm going to suffer tomorrow, I experience fear about that. Um, and I experience that fear from the inside. I anticipate it. I think of that's going to be my suffering. Uh, if I'm told that my child is going to suffer tomorrow, I may be more upset about that and I may uh, care about it even more. I might do more to try to prevent the suffering of my child, but I don't anticipate that suffering in an egoistic way because it's not going to be part of my consciousness. Um, 
Now, what people have always thought is that the reason that it's rational for me to feel this special kind of concern for some person in the future is just that I now will be identical with that person, that that person will be me. And they thought that that's why I have reason to fear that pain tomorrow, because that will be me. Mm -hmm. um, but in the early 1980s, the Oxford philosopher Derek Parfit challenged this idea, that is that, as he put it, identity is, or no, he didn't put it this way, I would put it this way, that identity is the basis for egoistic concern. He challenged that. He challenged it by means of a, a kind of hypothetical or a thought experiment, which was this. He said, we know that each one of us can survive with only one cerebral hemisphere. So um, we can then imagine the following science fiction example. Suppose doctors or surgeons separate, let's take, take you for example, separate your cerebral hemispheres and transplant one of them into one body of a person whose hemispheres have died but whose brain stem and body are still alive so they hook up one of your brain stem one of your hemispheres to that brain and they take the other hemisphere and put it in a different body and when that happens your body is from which your hemispheres have been removed is has no consciousness because the consciousness is all in the hemispheres and the hemispheres now have gone into different bodies Two people wake up, one in each of those bodies. Each of them believes that he is you. Each of them says, I am Ricardo Lopez. Um, uh, so what's happened? What Parfit says is, they can't both be you, but you are psychologically continuous with both of them. Because uh, both of them are continuers of your consciousness. But you... They can't both be you because that would imply that they are the same person, that there's only one person there. But they're two people now. Um, so what Parfit said about this is what this shows is that before your hemispheres are divided and transplanted in this way, you have reason to be egoistically concerned or concerned in this special way from the inside about both of these people, but neither one of them is going to be you. And so... He said, his slogan was, identity is not what matters. And so egoistic concern and identity, at least in these hypothetical cases, can come apart. And on Parfit's view about personal identity, they can actually come apart in real life. They can come apart in practice. And um, this, as you suggested when you asked the question, can be highly relevant to issues in ethics. Mm -hmm. Yes, and this also connects, at least in part, with uh, our interest in our own future, either we being interested in continuing living or not, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the most important way in which I, this is relevant to the ethics of killing is, I, or, or one obvious way in which it's relevant to the ethics of killing is, is in, in connection with abortion. Yeah. So, um, we think, what's, what, one reason, one of the moral reasons we have not to kill people is that killing people deprives them of good life that they w would otherwise have. Yeah. Uh, now, you might think, well, killing a fetus deprives somebody of the most good life anybody could have because it's right from the beginning. You know, um, if, I, if somebody kills you, you've already had, I don't know, some 20 or 30 years of good life already. I don't know what your age is. But um, you've had this, so you, you probably have less good life ahead of you than a fetus does. So a fetus would lose more, and yet we don't think that death for a fetus is as bad as death is for a 20-year-old or a 30-year-old. Now, why is that? It's because um, the relations that Parfit says are what matters rather than identity are weaker between the fetus and its future self and you and your future self. So I guess I didn't go far enough in explaining what Parfit says about this. What Parfit says is that before the 
double transplant operation in which your hemispheres are transplanted into two different bodies. Mm -hmm. Before that happens, he thinks it's rational for you to care from the inside, egoistically, about what's going to happen to both of those people, even though neither one of them will be you. That's rational because you before the... Oh, I forgot to turn my uh, email back off. Sorry. Uh, no problem. You before the uh, um, surgery will be psychologically connected to both of those people. Each one of them will have memories of your life. Uh, and you can, before the operation, plan for what each of them will do. You can have intentions that they will carry out. Each of them will have your beliefs, your desires, because they are made up of your hemispheres. And so um, what he says is what matters is not that some person in the future will be you, but what matters instead is that you will be related in these psychological ways to some person in the future. Now, in ordinary life, it's all identity and egoistic concern always coincide, except in some rare, rare instances on certain theories of personal identity. But here's the point um, about abortion, and that is that, as I was saying a moment ago, these psychological relations are matters of degree. Yeah. Yeah. And so you now have lots of beliefs that you will continue to have tomorrow. You have character traits and dispositions that you will have in the future. You have uh, desires for the future, which you will act on and fulfill. You have intentions that you will act on. And in the future, you will have memories of your life now. That's not true in the case of the relation between a fetus and itself in the future. And that, I think, is the explanation for why um, the death of a fetus is a lesser misfortune than the death of an adult is for the adult. That's a common view that the death of a fetus is a, is a lesser misfortune. But we need an explanation for that. And Parfit's understanding of what matters or what the rational basis for egoistic concern is, is what I think provides the explanation for that. And then that's relevant to the ethics of abortion because it suggests that when a fetus is killed, it's not harmed in anything like the way that an adult person is harmed when it's killed, mm -hmm. or when he or she is killed, I should say. Sure, sure. So uh, taking that into consideration and the fact that pr mm, the fetus is not as strongly psychologically connected with its interest in its own future as, for example, an adult is or a child is, um, would there be any ethically plausible way to defend late-term abortions or even early infanticide? Uh, yeah, because the same considerations that I think justify abortion after one of us begins to exist change only very gradually and slowly over time. So, um, a, a short way of uh, stating my view about abortion would be to say something like this. Um, I think we don't come into existence until about five months after conception. That's based on my own understanding of personal identity. Um, so but, I but, but, but why the five months? Is that when uh, babies become self-conscious or no. something like that? No, it's when uh, it's roughly about that time that we don't know exactly. Roughly about that time is when the fetal brain acquires the capacity for consciousness. And so at that time there, I, what I, my slogan would be, at that point there's someone there rather than just something. Okay. Uh, in other words, there's been all along a living human organism, but uh, I think we are not identical with our human organisms. Mm -hmm. um, this is my understanding of personal identity. I don't know if we've got time to go into this, so let me just state the view about abortion. We can come back to this if you want to. I, on my view of personal identity, if we begin to exist around about five months after conception, most abortions don't kill anybody like you or me. They, they can't be murder because there's nobody there. What's being killed is a living organism, but it's what I would call a kind of unoccupied organism. There's nobody there. 
uh, it's in a way like a brain dead organism that's kept alive to enable it to complete the gestation of a fetus during pregnancy, the kind of example I discussed earlier. That would be a case of, again, a, in my view, a living but un or unoccupied human organism. Um, but there is a point during the course of pregnancy at which one of us, somebody like you or me, does begin to exist. I mean, I began to exist around about five months after my mother got pregnant with her first uh, uh, child, which was me. Um, what makes abortion at that point, in my view, justifiable is twofold. First, the fetus at that point would not be badly harmed by being killed because it um, is not relevant, is, isn't connected in the ways that matter with its own future self. Okay. And secondly, because the fetus is lacking in self-consciousness, rationality, autonomy, it has no idea that it exists, it's just barely conscious in the way that a lower animal is, because of that it also has a much lower moral status at that time. Uh, you know, it doesn't have the properties that you and I have that make us worthy of a certain kind of respect, as Kant, as Kant would put it, that gives us a, a kind of dignity. Mm -hmm. um, the fetus, early fetus, lacks that. But human development and human psychological development are gradual, and I think our moral status changes, or the bases of our moral status change gradually over time. And so... Um, I do think that the objections to abortion grow stronger as pregnancy progresses, as the fetus matures psychologically, and that is true after we are born as well. We continue to mature psychologically quite rapidly after birth. I mean, it's amazing how rapidly uh, babies develop psychologically after birth. Um, but... I think it's very difficult for people to sustain the sharp distinction that almost everybody accepts between abortion and infanticide, and that's because the difference between a fetus and an infant is just a matter of location. A fetus is, is a human being living inside its mother's body, an infant is a human, or, a human being who's uh, just been born, recently been born. But um, we can now um, save the lives of infants born very prematurely, mm -hmm. around five months after conception, in fact. Uh, so they can be premature by three or four months and still survive. And what that means is one and the same being can be a fetus or an infant for a this period of about four months. Mm -hmm. And whether it's permissible to kill it surely can't depend on whether it's just inside or outside a woman's body. Its moral status depends on its own properties, not where it's located in space. Mm -hmm. And so if you think that it's permissible to have an abortion, let's say it can be permissible to have an abortion at, say, six or seven months after conception, then you have to explain why it would be murder to kill exactly the same being if it were born prematurely and were outside a woman's body. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult. Yeah. Everybody faces a challenge of consistency there. Yeah. So let me now ask you a broader question and maybe we can connect this with cases like euthanasia and suicide. So, is there any way for us to determine that death is objectively good or bad? E even if the death itself is provoked by someone, that, uh, that means that we die killed by someone or something like that, or we are assisted in our death by someone. I mean, uh, don't we also have to take into account the person's own uh, outlook on life, for example? I think people can think that their life w will not be worth living mm -hmm. and be mistaken. Okay. Um, partly that's a matter of prediction, 
they may predict what their future is going to be like and like and they may be mistaken about that that's obvious it's obvious that we can be mistaken in our predictions about the future but also people can be mistaken about what's good or bad about their lives um, and someone might think that a life of a certain sort would be a bad life to have, but they could be wrong about that. Or they could also think that a life would be a good life to have, and they could be wrong about that. I mean, the most obvious example would be somebody like Hitler. Hitler may have been happy, cheerful, and so on, um, but I think he had a very bad life for Hitler. That is to say, I, I think it would have been much better for Hitler, completely independently of what's true for anybody else, if he had died early in life. He had a life that was just a very bad life for a person to have, whatever he thought about it. Mm -hmm. so I, you know, but, but, but now we're getting into two separate issues. That is, that on the one hand, there's how people evaluate their own lives. On the other hand, there's how people try, try to objectively set uh, standards to evaluate uh, um, if a li if a life of another per if the life of another person is worth li worth living or not, right? Well, I think there's just one question here, and that is, is somebody's life worth living? Yeah. And uh, people may give different answers to that question. Uh, yeah. I do think. Each of us has, in general, for most of the time, each of us has greater insight into what makes his or her own life good and valuable than other people do. But I do think that, I mean, this is just my view. A lot of people disagree with me on this. I think that um, whether a life is a good life for a person is, to a large extent, an objective matter and people can be mistaken about that um, so uh, many people particularly younger people who kill themselves thinking that their lives are not worth living are probably mistaken about that and not just as a matter of prediction but also as a matter of evaluation mm -hmm. Um, but, but, but then maybe just to help with this question, when it comes to the bit about predicting how good a person's life will be and she deciding if she wants to continue leaving it or not, I mean, there are two major positions here, right? When, when, uh, one can be pessimistic or optimistic and think that, for example, life will become better if it's not at the moment, or that will become worse. So, I mean, uh, so we are assuming here that the default position for people should be, the, particularly if they still have uh, long years ahead of them, should be the optimistic one. Because I guess that it, I mean, we could we could make a case that both positions, the optimistic and the pessimistic, could be defensible with different arguments. I guess. Well, let me let me say something about the optimism and pessimism. It's not so much that it is. Um, well, look, there 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 are a few people, a minority of people, who think that it's actually objectively true that most people's lives are really not worth living, that our lives are really quite bad. We don't realize that, um, but that's the way it is. Uh, you are referring, for example, to the antinatalist. The antinatalist position, yeah. Um, I think that view is mistaken myself. Um, I have the opposite view. I think that um, most lives, almost all lives, are worth living. Mm -hmm. um, people found their lives worth living in the hope of escape and so on, even in the uh, Nazi concentration camps. The rate of suicide was not high in, in, the, in the Nazi camps. Um, 
And I, you know, I think those, those those people were right. It takes a it it takes a lot to make a life actually cease to be worth living. But there's also the question about what makes a life worth living and what makes a life better or worse. And this is the these are questions about the nature of well-being and the nature of happiness. Um, and those questions are very complicated. But I I do think that. Some people's lives go much better than other people's lives do. So some people have very, very good lives. Other people have lives that are very unfortunate and so on. They can all be worth living, but they're worth living to different degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's where disagreement arises. And I do think that there's a, a, a large objective component to our well-being and what makes a life good and worth living. Mm -hmm. And, the, and I do think that people can be, as I keep saying, people can be mistaken about that. Hitler can think his was a very good life. I think he's mistaken. Some people who are about to commit suicide may think their lives are, are, are really bad and not worth living, and I think they could be mistaken about that. But don't you also acknowledge that, uh, in fact, and I guess we can call this a fact, um, that people have different personalities and different interests and different uh, uh, views of life and things like that and all of that weighs in on how well they think their life is going and if they think the, it is good for them to continue living or not and uh, I mean th these are all of course subjective things but they still matter for these questions, particularly of end of life and things like uh, euthanasia and suicide. Right. Yeah, let me let me try to give you a fairly stark example of this kind of thing. Um, yeah. It it's part it, what you're referring to is partly to do with people's preferences and their interests and so on, but it's also to do with different people's natures. Sure. People are people can be different in very important ways, and that I think is the basis of the fact that a life that would be good for one type of person might not be good for, or would at least be less good for another type of person. Sure. So somebody who here's the starkest example, and this may take us. Uh, to, to other questions in, in ethics, the starkest example would be the case of somebody whose whole life has been one of intellectual pursuits, somebody who, uh, the phrase in English is, lives the life of the mind, somebody whose life has been devoted, let's say, to philosophy or science or something like that, That's uh, uh, and their, their good consists largely in living that way. And then you imagine such a person becoming becoming demented and going into a phase of progressive dementia. It might be bad for such a person to survive as somebody whose mental level is comparable to that of an animal. You know, somebody who can't speak, can't think uh uh, uh, about philosophy or science anymore. It's just a kind of contented but almost vegetable existence. Would be very bad for such a person. Might be less bad for somebody who care, whose whole, whole life has been lived caring about you know animal or sensual pleasures. Somebody who likes food and lying in the sun and that kind of thing. A demented person can still enjoy food and lie in the sun and get that kind of pleasure. So a life with severe dementia might be worth living for one person, but not worth living for another. So that that's a stark example, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. But it depends on a person's nature and not just on their preferences and so on. Mm -hmm. So the nature would be something like we could call it, I guess, personality, for example. Yeah, personality or character, something like yeah. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, do, do you agree that we can say then that there are different good lives? I mean, there there isn't one single good life, but there are several different ways that that ca that we can lead good lives. Yeah, definitely. I. Uh, 
the label for this view would be pluralism. Um, and I'm definitely a pluralist about um, uh, ways of life. There can be many very good ways of living a, a, a good life that are quite different. Mm -hmm. There's some things, that, there's some things that, that they all have in common. I mean, I think being morally good is always a part of a, of a good life. Yeah. Uh, so there, there's a certain amount of uniformity across the different types, but uh, yeah, uh, but yes, I think there can be many different ways of living a very good life. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you've already mentioned you're a vegan and you care about uh, things like animal rights or animal interests, at least, because I, I know there are people that don't like to associate the word rights with animals they prefer to call them interests because then we get into the legal realm and things like that but uh, would you say then that for other animals it's also true that we can talk about a good life like for example a good life for a dog a good life for a cow a good life for a cat and so on yeah, I think that's true for most animals. We can identify what's a, a good life for them. Uh, I think in general the best life of which an animal is capable is not going to be as good a life as a very good life for a person. Um, and that's because I think there are many dimensions of well-being that are accessible to people like you and me and your listeners that are not accessible to animals. Those dimensions would include um, very close personal relations based on mutual understanding and sympathy and concern, um, and there are just cognitive limitations that, uh, uh, that animals have that prevent uh, relations m among or between animals from being as deep as relations between people can be. Um, I think... Another dimension of well-being is achievement. We can achieve important things, um, and uh, animals can have achievements, but they're much more limited than those available to persons. And, you know, there's knowledge and aesthetic experience. Um, I was listening to Schubert's Ninth Symphony last night, and that's a form of experience uh, that, I, that I don't think that animals can have. And so, in general... Um, I do think that animals can can have well-being and that their well-being matters and it really matters and their suffering really matters and their suffering can be very much like ours mm -hmm. um, but I don't I don't think that their well-being can be as um, rich and varied and reach the heights that our well-being can mm -hmm. But couldn't, for example, an extreme vegan object to that and say that the only reason you put humans above other animals in terms of moral status is because you are referring to things that are uh, in, a, in a way anthropocentric because we are the only animals that are able to experience art and are able to, uh, I mean, uh, we are the only animals probably that have religion and that are able to experience these sorts of things. And uh, I mean, all of the things that you mentioned, basically, couldn't someone object that that is a sort of an anthropocentric view if we are to put humans one level above other animals? Uh, well, um... I think the important point here is that as far as we know, as far as we can tell, um, the f forms of well-being that animals are capable of experiencing and enjoying are ones that we can experience and enjoy as well. So we know, for example, that animals enjoy eating, they enjoy, especially young animals, enjoy playing. They many of many types of animal enjoy companionship and uh, social activity together. Um, but these are all forms of well-being that we experience as well, and we don't. I don't want to undervalue those. They are important aspects of everybody's lives. But I'm saying there are other dimensions of well-being that I think only we. Have. So we have what they have and more, 
And I think that's the okay. that's the major difference. Mm -hmm. So far as okay. we know, so far as we know. <laughs> okay, I understand. So uh, let me ask you now another question. I'm not sure if this will be the last one because we are reaching our time limit. So probably it will be. Uh, what is ethically different between killing and letting someone die simply? Well, uh, here I'll, I'll refer to uh, a, a, a phrase that uh, a philosopher friend of mine, Frances Cam, uses, and she says that when we l allow someone to die, they lose only something that they could have had with our assistance. Mm -hmm. But when we kill somebody, we take from them what they would have had independently of us altogether. Um, that may be, may be part of the difference. Um, and another part of the difference is that when we kill someone, we are causally directly responsible for the for the losses that that person suffers and so we are morally more responsible in most cases unless we had some antecedent special reason to save someone's life um there are there we there there are many conditions that may excuse us or release us from any obligation to save someone's life, um, but it's just much harder to to justify taking direct responsibility for killing somebody. Mm -hmm. That's a I'm sorry. That's a very inadequate answer. Um, <laughs> let me let me say this. Okay. <sighs> In my own case, I think that it's difficult to find deep theoretical justification for a strong asymmetry between the morality of killing and the morality of allowing people to die. It's, it's, it, it, it's much more that we find that we believe in that the relevance of that distinction when we consult our intuitions about a broad range of cases we just find over and over and over again that we find killing somebody to be more seriously wrong than allowing someone to die even when we try to hold all the other relevant considerations constant like intention and cost to me of saving someone's life and the cost to me of not killing someone and so on and so forth we try to hold all that to um, uh, constant, we still find intuitively that there's something um, that seems to us more intuitively in objectionable about killing. Now, that may just be evolutionary programming. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm open to that possibility. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm looking at the time and probably it's better for us to end the interview now because I guess that any other question that I could pose now would, leave us, would lead us down a very complicated route. So let, let's finish now, uh, Jeff. And uh, before we go, uh, I will be leaving links to your books in the description box of the interview. Would right. you like to mention any places on the internet where people can get in touch with your work? Uh, I have a website that I think one can find just by putting my name in a, a, a search engine like Google and it will take you to the take people to the website and there I have links to my publications and to some interviews and maybe some popular pieces that I've written for the New York Times or places like that I think that would probably be the best best thing Okay, so I will include that in the description box of the interview, both for the video for one and the audio only version. So, Jeff, thank you again for taking the time to come on the show. It was a real pleasure to everyone. And 
Uh, I hope that somewhere in the future we are able to continue the conversation. There are several different questions that I left out today, so I would really love to have you again on the show. Invite, invite me back. I'd be happy to do it again. I'm sorry that we're running out of time now. Um, you know, as you know, I've got a squash match soon, <laughs> so I've got to run off to that. But thank you so much for this. I, I appreciate the... Um, the really uh, the, the intelligence uh, of the questions that you asked they were really probing and uh, insightful questions uh, so so thank you for that and i've enjoyed enjoyed talking with you ricardo thanks hi everybody thank you for watching this interview until the end as you might have noticed i've been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields so to keep the channel sustainable i would like to ask you to please visit my patreon page and to consider making a pledge there any amount even just one dollar would already be a great help otherwise you can also help me through paypal and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons or and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perugel Larson, Lau Guerrero, Chantal Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Sergio Condriano, Iane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henrik Alenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Drs. Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss and Bo Weingart, my four producers, Isar Webbe, Rosie, Jim Frank and Lucas Stafiniak and finally my executive my executive producer Michel Rugieski thank you for all